Hi, Dan. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Vancouver? Things are great, James. Thanks for having me. Dan, Endeavor Silvers had a great 2021 with improved production at your flagship mine, Guanacivi, and the release of your feasibility study at your growth project, Terronera. And you recently announced a new acquisition in Mexico, Mexico called Pateria. And But before we dive into these various assets, why don't we just start with a brief overview of Endeavor Silver for those viewers who might not be familiar with the company. Yeah, I mean, Endeavor Silver's now been around for about 15 years. Um, Brad Cook was our founder, and he moved from the, the CEO role to the executive chairman role uh, this year, actually. So I took over May 2021 in this position. I was the CFO for 14 years, so I've been around for, for quite a while. And we're based out of Vancouver, uh, headquartered here, but our operations are in Mexico. We have uh, the Guana Civi asset, as you touched on. It's kind of our flagship asset we built the company off of. The Bolonitos asset, a bit more south in the state of Guanajuato, also in Mexico. And then we have some development assets, the Terranera project. Um, we have the Peral project in the state of Chihuahua. And, and ultimately, yeah, we just picked up Pitaria from uh, SSR Mining, uh, who are rationalizing their portfolio. So we've got a great base in Mexico. We're also based in Nevada, USA. We've got an exploration property there. And we've also got an exploration properties four or five actually down in Chile as well. So we're trying to grow and our, our focus is try to get to become a senior silver producer uh, over the next decade. Dan, that's a great overview. And you mentioned that you have two producing silver mines and in the interest of time, I just want to focus on the larger of the two of the two and that's Guana Civi. And consolidated silver production was 4.8 million ounces on the year, 42 million or 42,000 ounces of gold, or 8.3 million ounces of silver equivalent. And this yep. was primarily driven by this mine. And I just want to touch on what exactly you and your team did to drive this performance this year. Yeah, I mean, this year's performance really dates back to historical years. I mean, like I say, we've been at Guana Civi now 15 years, never had more than a two-year reserve life. Ultimately, it's kind of like uh, pearls on a necklace. You go down that, and one of the keys for any underground mine is is mine development and making sure we, we're staying ahead of it, uh, and we have enough stope opens to meet production profiles. In 2017, 2018, with the lower silver prices, your margins contract, your cash flow contracts, and ultimately you end up starving a little bit of the mine to try to manage your cash flow as best you can, but it impacts your longer term production. And I think it got we got caught with that in 2017, 2018, and made a lot of changes in 2019, uh, start refocusing on mine development. We bought a new fleet. So all the work to 2020 and 2021, where we've beat guidance at Guana Civi stems from that. And, the second part to it is uh, in 2019 of October, we signed an agreement with Frisco, one of the largest uh, miners in Mexico, family conglomerate owned by actually Carlos Slim, to acquire some land around that, made a discovery and brought that discovery into production in 2020 and 2021. And uh, the grades have been phenomenal and ultimately led to our uh, beating guidance for 2020 and 2021. Well, that's interesting. I didn't realize Carlos Slim was involved in the mining industry. Does he actually own any mines or he just owns property? No, yeah. Frisco's uh, Mexican base. They have five, six different operations across diversified, whether it's gold or, or copper. He's got a, a nice portfolio for sure. You always want to have a little bit of gold and silver in your portfolio. Absolutely. In the world that we live in today and with what governments do, um, I think it's a good spot to be and obviously it's been uh, throughout times a store of wealth and gold's been a phenomenal thing and for us we produce about 40 percent of our revenue comes from gold 60 percent comes from silver so we are a silver producer and what we're seeing in the silver space and what's happening from an industrial aspect coupled with the monetary aspects of silver um, we're excited where we're at and we're excited about the properties we have coming to be able to take advantage of that so I just want to uh, ask you a couple more questions on Guana Civi before we move on. But you also had higher grades this year and your all-in sustaining costs were also lower. Can you just touch on those two elements, please? Yeah, I mean, they go hand in hand. The grade ties to the El Curso concession and, and bringing that online in 2020. We, we do a reserve and resource report, but we've even improved from that reserves and resources, ultimately what we're actually mining. 
you always tend to be a little bit conservative when you're estimating and I think we were conservative and that's showing up in our production profile and with higher grades uh, on a per ton basis we're producing more ounces of silver. We Bannock want us to be for 15 years. We know the cost structure and when we put out guidance the ultimately what's driven our all in sustaining costs down is the higher grade on a per ton basis. So we are starting to see some costs increase um, definitely from a supply chain standpoint in 2021. Um, the inflation that we're seeing kind of in North America and around the world, that's percolated its way into the mining space as well. So we have seen costs push up, but luckily our production profile was higher than what we planned and ultimately drove our all in sustaining costs on a per ounce basis down. And can we expect the same in 2022, higher production, higher grades? Yeah, we're going to come up with guidance uh, in the coming weeks. Ultimately, we have our reserves and our resources. I expect the grades at Guana Sui to be similar to what we had in 2021. Uh, so that would mean a similar production profile. The plant capacity is about 1,200, 1,250 tons per day. And we basically run that this year and in, in the past year at 2021. We expect to do the same in 2022. Dan, let's move on to your development project, Teronera, which, uh, which when it's in full production, it's going to almost double the size of your silver output. The big news in 2021 was release of the feasibility study. Why don't you take us through that and why don't we just look at the some of the primary features like net present value, internal rate of return, and also sure. payback? Yeah, no, I mean, Terranera is a game changer for our company and ultimately uh, completely puts us on a different profile than what we have with Guanacy and Bolanitos. Those assets, we've been there for 15 years and 14 years respectively. They're great assets, they're steady state. They are higher cost um, assets, um, just because of all the length of time we're there, where we are in the deposits, et cetera, et cetera. For us, Terranera is an organic discovery we made. Uh, it's a land package we picked up in 2010 and ultimately fully owned it in 2013. Made a discovery, We've got about 86 million ounces, or sorry, 78 million ounces defined as M&I and ultimately in our mine plan at Terranera. We put that feasibility study out. It's a very robust uh, project. At today's prices, uh, you're looking at about 30% IRR. Uh, net present values uh, just shy of $300 million with a CapEx of about 175 million. So very bite size. We're working on a debt package today, going through due diligence with banks and ultimately use the cash that we have on our balance sheet and some debt, which we currently have zero debt on our balance sheet to be able to bring Terranera into production. And as you say, it will double our production. But the great thing about Terranera is ultimately its cost profile. On a cash cost basis, the cash cost is about 59 cents per ounce of silver. Uh, and that's on our base case. At using prices today, you're looking at negative cash costs. All in sustaining costs, you're effectively using all the gold. We'll pay for that silver. You're thinking, we're thinking about a dollar, dollar, 50 all in sustaining costs again on a base case if you look at today's prices gold is that byproduct uh, cash costs all in sustaining cash costs are negative so there's not many projects in the silver space that have come around um, and this completely changes us takes us from a, a tighter margin to basically cuts our cost profile in half because cash costs are zero and all in sustaining costs are near zero uh, and then as you say doubles our production Terranera, first four years, we'll do about seven and a half million silver equivalent ounces per year. And over the 12 year life that we've defined, it'll average six, six and a half million ounces silver equivalent per year. And Dan, I just want to get a better understanding of the cost, the all in sustaining cost. Why is it or why will it be so much lower at Terranera than it will be at your other producing mines? Uh, fresh ore bodies, um, but there's, there's a number of characteristics of why. Um, Grade, gold is a byproduct. So the gold that we produce is, is coming off those costs. But even from a cost per ton standpoint, which is the main driver of our costs, those are gonna be lower on a per ton standpoint because of how shallow the deposit is, um, how thick the deposit is. So basically at Bolonitos and even at Guanacy, Bolonitos we run about two to three meters in thickness. Guanacy we run about three to four meters in thickness. At Terranera, it, the deposit averages five and a half meters to six meters in thickness. Uh, it's very shallow. There is a lot of opportunity at Terranera to depth um, and a long strike. So we're excited about that. But just on that 12 year mine life, um, the thickness, the shallowness, the grades is what's going to drive that lower cost per ounce compared to our other operations. 
And Dan, let's talk about the timeline associated with construction and eventually production. Yeah, uh, I would say most of our permits are in place. There's always permits that you have to get after you get certain permits and as the construction period goes. Um, we're very close on that. There's minor extensions with the new feasibility study put out. We've got amendments just pushing out some boundaries where we want to put a run a mill pad where we're putting a staging area. Basic things. If we want to get construction started today, we can and we've started certain things. Um, the construction period is two years. We'll get formal construction decision from our board ultimately when we have the financing package in place. The plan is to have that done here by the end of Q1 2022. And with that financing package, we can hit the ground running. But we have already ordered mobile fleet. Some of it's arrived, some more is arriving in March. We've ordered, we have a ball mill already sitting uh, near site. Uh, there's a number of things that we're doing to make sure that we meet a two year timeline from a construction period. If we can meet that two year timeline and be on time, it'll help us be on budget for that project. And I'm sorry, remind me again what the CapEx is associated with this project? Yeah, right now in our feasibility study, the initial CapEx is $175 million. Um, that was spent basically linear through the two-year construction process. I think early on, there's a lot of earthworks need, needs to be done, about six months worth of earthworks that's going to impact how that cash goes out. But with long lead items and making it, it's generally, like I say, a linear path of $175 million over the two years. Dan, that was a great overview. Let's move on now. Your latest news is the acquisition of a very large undeveloped silver project in Mexico called Pedaria for $70 million, and this was acquired from SSR. Why don't you just give us a brief overview of this asset and also what was the rationale for acquiring it? Yeah, I mean, Pedaria, since the original discovery by Silver Standard, which turned into SSR Mining, uh, they'd staked it and made the discovery in 2002. Ultimately, it's one of the largest undeveloped silver deposits in the world. I mean, the discovery really is fantastic. And they, they advanced that all the way to 2009, where they put an underground pre-feasibility study on it. And, and then in 2009, the silver world changed. Silver ran um, from 2010 to 2012 up to $50. They reconceptualized what Pitria was. Uh, they saw it for all the halo effects, the oxides, the sulfides, and actually came out with the super pit. Um, still considered what a, a great project, but ultimately silver came back since 2012 when they put out that feasibility study and kind of languished here in the teens and in the low 20s. And ultimately their feasibility study was done at $25 silver. Fast forward another couple of years, uh, Alistair and, and SSR Silver Standard merged new management team. They're rationalizing their portfolio an opportunity for us. They're focused on gold, they're focused on other areas. We're focused on silver. The Pitheria deposits got 525 million ounces defined under m and I. I mean, if you compare that to what we have at Endeavor, we're close to 200 million ounces silver equivalent. So that's our gold and our silver taken into account. This is 525 million ounces of silver defined as a resource at Pitheria plus lead plus zinc, which is about half the deposit. So. Uh, we're excited to be able to acquire it. Uh, we think it was a very fair purchase price on both sides. I think both sides have been very happy with the deal, very positive from, from our standpoint, from our shareholders. I think it's been positive from theirs. They are going to be a 5% shareholder. They're taking some shares in the deal, um, but we're excited. And we've got a lot of exploration to do. We're going to prove up the resource. So we've got some, to make it a current resource under Canadian guidelines under 43101. Uh, but we expect to have that done in 2022, and then we'll put an economic study on it uh, for 2023. So your development team is going to be very busy going between Terra and also Pedaria. How are they going to balance that time? Yeah, it, they are going to be busy, and that's a phenomenal problem to have. And ultimately, Terra and our development team, that's our focus for the next two years. They will focus on developing that. Our exploration team will focus on, on uh, Pedaria especially for 2022. When we get into the economic studies, we can move some of our engineers over to over from Terranera to Pithria, but we'll also use external consultants primarily on a feasibility study or pre-feasibility study, depending on where we're at and what stage we're at with Pithria. Um, so it shouldn't take any focus away from Terranera, but ultimately with Pithria, uh, we've got to let the geology and figure out what our resource is and look at those numbers. Then we'll look at different scales of production. And ultimately, Endeavor's in underground minor um we're not open pit 
the way we see Pythria coming out will probably be an underground mine, but that's yet to be determined. We'll figure out the resource, put it in the hands of the engineers, see what the studies say, and then go forward from that. Dan, as you mentioned, the asset was acquired from SSR. What will you and your team do differently than what they did? Yeah, I, to be honest, I think they've done a great job defining that resource. I mean, because it's, it is dated, it's 2012, we will make it a current resource. Uh, for them, it just became a rationalization of their portfolio, their focus on gold. They made a pivot. There's a reason why they used to be called Silver Standard. They changed their name to SSR. They picked up a lot of gold assets, and there's only a handful of us primary silver producers out there. Um, a lot of the silver producers moved into gold over the last 10 years, and we've stayed on the silver path, partly because of our discovery of Terranera, partly because we believe in that metal over the next couple decades. So um, it's not that we're going to do anything different. It's just something that makes sense in our portfolio compared to their portfolio, and we think we can advance it, and we're going to reconceptualize some of the things they, the previous management team at SSR Mining did, and ultimately we think it's going to work out very well for our shareholders. That's a great overview. Thank you. You recently came out with your Q4 production numbers and full year numbers for 2021. Yeah. And you made mention of the fact that you sold 1.4 million ounces of silver, 8.7 thousand or 8,700 ounces of gold, but you also held back some silver and some gold. Is this something you do often? And what was the rationale for doing this? We do it time to time. I mean, it's just based on what we're seeing in the in the in the marketplace, what's happening in the silver price or gold price at any given time. And we've held back uh, silver for most of 2021. Actually, we held back some in Q2, more in Q3, and kind of kept that same level here at the end of the year. And ultimately, it's the believing in in the silver price. We have a very healthy balance sheet at this point in time. We don't have any long-term debt. We have over $100 million in cash at September 30th. We had this bullion that's worth about $30 million. Working capital um, was over $150 million. So we had the, the, the benefit of our balance sheet to be able to make these decisions when we can and cannot sell our metal. Now, with the acquisition of Pythoria and, and the build of Terranera coming, we're going to sell that metal. But we do expect to sell it in a higher price environment than what we finished the year at. And that's just our belief in, in silver over the short term and ultimately over the long term. But it's just a management strategy over a short period of time. We don't like to sell into a falling market and ultimately like see a base and it come back. The ebbs and flows of, of the metals market is what we're trying to take advantage of. Dan, as we wrap up, you made mention of the fact that there's very few silver companies now. And you made mention of the fact that SSR used to be silver standard. I totally forgot about that company. but and now they're focused on gold. But why do you think that is? Why are so few companies focused on silver and more and more of these, what used to be silver companies are focusing more on gold? Yeah, it, it, a couple factors I think go into it. One's the scarcity of silver projects and primary silver pro projects. If you look at silver production in the world, we produce somewhere about 800 million ounces, peaked at a billion ounces per year. Only 30% of that production comes from a primary silver mine. Um, to get scale and to, once you get to a certain size of silver, it's how do you replace that production and maintain the profile and growth of a company. And I mean, we're all taught through years of experience and some of us through school that growth is a good thing and you always want to provide growth. That means that you're moving forward. And sometimes you get stuck. If you can't find a silver asset to replace ounces you previously produced, you start looking at gold assets. And I mean, gold and silver are nice fits together. There's monetary aspects to it. And, often found in the same deposit so i think part mostly it has to do with uh what's the next evolution of the company how do you continue to grow and sometimes it comes down to patience and finding that right project in the right jurisdiction and other times it's management just wants to pivot and they see an opportunity and opportunities sometimes in geology you're looking for silver and you, you end up with with a different metal or gold and you end up with a different metal and that might 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 change that path of those companies but i think it really comes down to the scarcity of silver deposits in the world dan that's a great overview as we wrap up what can investors expect in terms of news flow from endeavor silver in the coming weeks and months yeah i mean a lot's happening obviously with this acquisition um we've got lots happening in the company we do have our other expiration assets we have Pharrell. We put out drill results there in December. We'll have more drilling here in, in 2022 and expect to have results coming out at Guanas to be Bolognese and Corral when it comes to expiration. 
again at Terranera. I think the key drivers though coming up is the financing package for Terranera and, and the formal construction decision before the quarter's out. Uh, we will put out guidance for 2022. We generally do that at the end of January. Uh, and then it's normal operations and we'll continue to look from an M&A standpoint, what we can put into our portfolio that makes sense to add value for our shareholders. Dan, thank you very much for that update on Endeavor Silver. And to all of our viewers, if you have any questions for Dan and his team, please send us an email to info at bloorstreetcapital.com and we'll make sure you get an answer to your questions. Or if you would like some research on Endeavor Silver, send us an email and we'll send it along. Once again, Dan, thank you. Thanks, James.